everybody. Due to a change of the venue, some of you might be a bit confused. Uh, the thing about the EU, uh, EU uh, data protection reform is on stage one, and now we have here uh, the Outernet, a presentation about a revolution which is not taking place online, as we talked about many times um, these days, but taking place in the real world in Egypt and the Middle East. And I would like to welcome our three speakers, Jay Cousins, Adam molino berry and Vael Fajarani. So are you going to do this, right? Is there a mic? Oh, I, oh, I don't need a mic. I'm, I'm wired. Okay, perfect. Can everybody hear me? Cool. So um, uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, talking about uh, what has happening in my region, Middle East and North Africa, over the last couple of years, and how we've experienced incredible growth, uh, not only in the physical world, but also things that are happening on the street, uh, in Cairo, in Tunisia, in most of the North African region, which I, which I handle in Google. Um, as you probably know, we, um, uh, maybe you don't, we started, um, we started Google in the Middle East uh, five and a half years ago, um, and it was only me for five, six months. For five, six months, I was basically uh, in my uh, home with no office, uh, working from, um, from home. And uh, we, we have grown over the last couple of years, and um, the title of my presentation is basically betting bit, uh, big on technology, and uh, I, I honestly believe that technology has changed my life, has changed the life of people around me, and has made tremendous progress over the last uh, couple of years in, in my region. And let me explain to you why. But before, uh, before I start, I want to talk to you a little bit about Google mission in the Middle East. We probably are doing the same thing as anywhere in the world. We would like to organize the information of the world and make it universal, accessible at all devices uh, in all languages. Uh, five and a half years ago, maybe six years ago when we started, the search was not working properly. YouTube was not launched. Mobile, uh, Android even did not exist in the Middle East. So just to give you a perspective, the, my region is about 18 countries, um, 350 million people. Um, 300 million of them are on mobile, uh, 100 million internet users, probably 110 right now internet users, and, and 56 million computers. Um, uh, the, the, what is staggering is that the um, amount of mobiles and smart devices that are basically coming in, in the region, we try to be very much local. So. In the first year of our existence, we worked very closely uh, with our Arabic software engineers to localize search and make it with uh, the Egyptian slang, with the Moroccan slang, with the Tunisian slang. And we actually came up with what we call a, a doodle for Google. Uh, this is our famous doodle for Google. Um, and and we, started, so, so we started basically making sure that the internet is touching everything that we do in, in our life. Um, uh, there were four million people in Egypt uh, online in 2007. Now we have about 35 million people, so in incredible and, and, and staggering growth. Um, and it's not a secret that we, all of a sudden, 65% of the population in our part of the world is less than 30. So the internet is basically shaping. The, these guys grew up in the internet age. They grew up with mobiles, with handheld devices connected to the internet. We've, we've done a study in Egypt uh, saying that um, it proved that the second most watched activity uh, uh, while, uh, sorry, the, the second most uh, done activity while, while watching TV is actually searching online. You know what's the first most watched activity? What's the first most activity? Is eating. We, 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 uh, we actually uh, like to watch TV and eat. But the second thing we like to do is actually search online. A lot of Egyptians search online to basically make sure that what the TV is saying is correct. So most of the stuff that the TV is saying sometimes is not correct. 
or a little bit out of context. So um, the internet has touched everything we do in our part of the world. It has touched our entertainment, our publishing, our commerce, our education, our healthcare, uh, our travel, how we consume information. Um, it's been an incredible force for good. But what I want to talk to you a little bit about is the untapped opportunity of the internet, the economic value of the internet, what we call the internet economy in, in, in our part of the world. A couple of months ago, we published a, um, a study with Boston Consulting Group that shows actually that uh, the internet economy in Egypt represents around 2% of the GDP. This is compared to uh, things like healthcare, uh, transportation, is actually a little bit more than transportation and healthcare. Healthcare is about 1.6% of the GDP. Transportation is about 1.8% of the GDP. And the internet right now represents 2%. But what is incredible about this part of the world is the opportunity for growth is, is really big. And I want to focus on three specific things. An economic impact, how basically it touches the life uh, the internet can touch the life of millions and millions of small businesses. Just to give you an idea, we have two and a half, just in Egypt alone, two and a half million registered company, 19 million students. My region has 149, uh, 194 million people, and 49, of, 49 million of them are, are, are students. Students as in K-12 to university. Uh, obviously, the export opportunity and uh, the value that it can add to, to people. But if you, if you look at the consumer trends, what, what's happening right now is especially after the revolution, um, you basically ride a taxi in Egypt and you ask the, the taxi person, the driver, what do you know about uh, the internet? He would probably know Facebook, he would know Twitter, and he would know YouTube. Basically, people even if they don't know how to read and write, they ask their kids to basically put on YouTube and watch videos uh, of politicians, watch videos of people who either uh, talk serious or uh, entertain them. And people comment. People comment on videos. People have microphones, uh, as this slide uh, suggests. Uh, everybody has a big megaphone. Everybody has an opinion. It is a normal cycle that we're going through that people are basically expressing themselves and they want to be heard. So um, if it's not on YouTube, it doesn't exist. This is what a lot of people say. Uh, I want a little bit to talk about some statistics of uh, the internet and just to give you an idea that 40 million Egyptians cannot read and write. So out of 90 million people, around 40 million people cannot read and write. And we have 35 million online growing at 40%. We have 40 million queries per day. 85% of the people basically use uh, online to start the journey with, with the internet. They basically use search. Um, and YouTube has been a stagger, staggering growth. It grew from 2 million playbacks per day to 40 million playbacks per day, touching all aspects of life. Not necessarily entertainment or news, but basically education, healthcare, how to, product reviews, many, many things. And 12% of, of these searches actually come from mobile. 12%. The, 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 the 40 million playbacks of YouTube are, uh, have grown 20 folds in the last two years. Then we thought that maybe people are watching, you know, um, a lot of entertainment and uh, we wanted to know who exactly is watching this. And, and we commissioned uh, uh, TNS to do a study for us. And just to give you an idea that it's about 60-40 between men and women. The average YouTube user in Egypt has an age of 35. The majority has an income between 2,000 to 5,000 Egyptian pounds. Uh, this is about 200 to 400 euros, depending on who's counting. Uh, and what's the exchange rate. And 28% uh, of people watching YouTube are actually watching it from their smartphones and from their, uh, from their um, devices. Still, TV is big. TV is huge. When you look at TV alone, 
uh, you have 189 minutes of uh, watch time per day. But the crazy thing is that accessing the internet is 165, listening to radio is 87, and accessing the internet from mobile is actually 73. So if you add the 73 plus the 165, it actually gives you um, more uh, time per day for people accessing the internet. And, and I'm not talking about your typical class A or class B. I'm talking about the whole population across the geography. We actually know the exact IP map. So there is um, a lot of uh, momentum happening in the internet space. Okay, maybe this is not going to work. Uh, I'm trying to move to the next slide. But I guess this is the problem with Microsoft technology, right? Uh, can we move to the next slide? Okay, yeah, working? I think, I think you can see the arrows. Oh, the arrows, okay. Microsoft. Anyway. So uh, we have incredible statistics about uh, what's happening in the, in, the inter in the internet world, but I actually want to focus a little bit outside Egypt where there's more dispensable income. There's, there are more people with dispensable income, and I just want to show you the staggering numbers of um, mobile phones, smartphones, and even basic phone penetration of using, using the, the mobile. Uh, Saudi Arabia has the highest number of YouTube playbacks per person, period. It is literally four or five times higher than the US. So the young people in Saudi Arabia, the young people in Egypt, have day jobs in the morning, and in the afternoon, they sit in front of their mobile cameras and basically record things. They do arts, they do culture, they do entertainment, and obviously they do politics all the time. But I guess, uh, and, and I'm talking about uh, uh, YouTube channels, private YouTube, YouTube, YouTube channels with 100 million users, 75 million users, millions and millions of watch time. So what, I was, what I'm trying to paint to you is that it's a, oh, 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 I mean, watching the news from here, watching what's happening uh, worldwide, you look at CNN, you look at your normal TV channel, you wouldn't understand what's happening in the, on the streets of the Middle East because people are using, are venting out using different, different um, uh, uh, methods of uh, communication. I also want to quickly talk to you about how we touch uh, different parts of the ecosystem and then I'll finish by saying what can we do together? My idea of how can we basically use conferences like this, venues like this to do better and bigger things for, for uh, the, the young people uh, in Egypt. So, so we work in a very interesting environment where we touch a lot of industries. I guess we, we're very close to the advertising and I always say that advertising has been good to us. We made some good money from advertising. But we also have a dedicated Arabic-speaking team uh, based in Dublin and Egypt that looks after the small and medium businesses. So how to empower small and medium businesses with tools, with technologies, to either save cost, save cost or grow revenue. We work very closely with uh, universities and academic uh, institutions. We actually have thousands of student ambassadors uh, across the Middle East. We are extremely excited about having more and more um, Arabic content. I always give the example of a small country in Eastern Europe called Czech Republic that has 10 million people, and there is more Czech content online than the whole Arabic content. The Arabic con so uh, the Arab world is around 350 million people, which is about four and a half, five percent of the world's population, but we have less than one percent of the content of, of, of online. Uh, so we provide publishing platforms and platforms to encourage more and more Arabic content, developer community outreach, uh, advertising agencies. But the two, the two very interesting um, um, 
areas where I think we can cooperate is uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, we signed an agreement with the Egyptian government a couple of years ago, and we're trying to replicate it across, across uh, the Middle East, is that they basically invest money in advertising, and we take 25% of the money, and we put it in a fund to encourage in, in entrepreneurship and in innovation. We, we started by creating a business plan competition for, um, for um, um, uh, startups. We toured the country, found 14,000 kids, um, uh, narrowed them to 1,200, 50, 20, and we basically gave one company $200,000. But we will never do beauty contest, you know, business plan competition anymore. The cost is just too high. So we decided actually to do something very similar to um, uh, uh, iHubs or uh, 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 technology hubs or co-working spaces. We, we actually want both the business community and the technology community to get together in a physical place. We are going to fund this place for one or two years, and we want to have a community manager and a facility manager that basically gets this place to be a vibrant tech co-working space, where VCs, angel investors, students, entrepreneurs, um, uh, academic institutions can come and, and, and even us and our competitors can come and uh, uh, sort of give sessions and encourage people. We are launching our first um, uh, 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 co-working space in a few weeks. Uh, uh, it is still confidential. Uh, I know that I'm on camera, but it is still confidential. Uh, but uh, I'm probably very excited about this, much more than growing the revenue of Google in Egypt, because it's a, it is a physical place that gets people together. And if we can reach out to more and more young entrepreneurs, it will be extremely exciting to replicate this model across the country. I'm a firm believer that we should get out of Cairo and Alexandria. We should do this in the suburbs. We should do this in the rural areas. And we should actually replicate this across the Middle East. There are some co-working spaces in Dubai, but it's for the rich entrepreneurs, people who can afford to have you know, a $4 coffee while talking about entrepreneurship, but it's uh, not as exciting as something like this. I don't know if you know about the campus in London, so think the campus in London um, uh, uh, with the Egyptian um, twist. So um, I, I want to finish by saying that um, I only see opportunities. Uh, call me a romantic, call me a stupid guy. I unfortunately only see opportunities uh, in my region. We have a small uh, um, security problem. We have a small energy problem. It's going to be a tough summer. And we have a small currency problem. We've lost about 38% of the value of the Egyptian pounds. But I only see opportunities. I only see young people who are hungry to learn more and more things. Uh, I, I look about. Uh, I, I look to the barriers to change rather the barriers to than, than the barriers to entry. I look at speed, economics, skills, technology, inertia, and I think we are about to crack something that is very interesting. There are probably five, six incubators, co-working spaces, accelerators in the country. If we can just enlarge this a little bit, we have 26 governorates. If we can do 26 of those over the next couple of years, then we will have solved a lot of things. Um, wh what is great about uh, the real revolution is that although it, is, it was easy to do, it's very hard to finish, we never finished it. I don't think it uh, will ever be finished. It's a work in progress. But at least the, my generation, uh, where I was only told to mind my own business and uh, basically which, which means just walk next to the wall um, and this is the wall uh, I think you know in Berlin the meaning of a wall but my, my generation has also um, seen something very interesting which is young people who want to break this wall and although we think that um, there is a mobile revolution, there is an internet revolution, but we had a real, a real, real revolution in the, um, in, in, in the country. Whether it's going to continue or not, the technology and the internet represents an incredible positive atmosphere where people are only seeing the half full uh, side of things and people are excited. 
and I, I invite you all to come to Egypt and, um, and, and do this like, little, this, like this little girl to wear sunglasses, uh, different glasses with different colors, because you will see a completely different uh, uh, positive aspect of, uh, of the community. Uh, I invite you all to come to my country. Uh, just be vigilant. Uh, make sure that you're uh, safe and secure. Uh, not in the summer, please. Maybe after the summer, it's going to be hot. Uh, we also have Ramadan coming, uh, and uh, I, I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. No? Yes? There we go. Right. So good afternoon, people. Um, my name is Adam Molyneux-Berry. I'm going to tell you guys about uh, Ice Cairo, but uh, it'll be a story more than anything else, hopefully. And um, it'll be a story of how we're riding this wave of post-revolution Egypt. Just before I start, actually, just to let you know that we're supported by GIZ, and we're incubated by an Egyptian NGO called Nahdat al-Mahrusa. So we're actually one of the projects that have been incubated since the revolution. So. What happens when you get capitalism, globalization, and dictatorship mixed together? Well, you get the conditions that create police brutality, youth unemployment, poverty, and hunger. And really, with these conditions, all you need is a straw that breaks the camel's back. And uh, this is the guy called Khalid Said. He was um, an activist, he was trying to expose police corruption, and as a result, he was brutally murdered in public, and was one of the reasons that the revolution really kicked off. So, you know, you've, you've broken the camel's back, and what you get is a revolution. So just look at this just for a second, because, you know, whilst this was happening, the Egyptian state media was saying that there was no one in Tahrir Square, absolutely no one, and this was the reality. Um, and this is really why the, the events became, you know, kind of taken over by people. And it, it became taken over through social media. So really, you know, Facebook and Twitter were really the birth of Egyptian self-organization. They really were. You know, the, the military brass had no idea what Facebook or Twitter were. They had no idea that you could coordinate a revolution using Facebook and Twitter. And, you know, they, these guys were joking. They just didn't know that this could actually happen. Um, and this really was the birth of Egyptian self-organization. So if we talk about self-organization, you know, have a look at this picture. You know, it's, it's really powerful. You know, the state media was telling people, and they still tell people, that on the ground in Egypt, you have this massive sectarian divide between Muslims and Christians, and that this is just the way Egypt is. But the reality is, here you see Christians protecting Muslims during the Friday prayers. You know, you have people protecting people, totally self-organized totally against what the status quo is telling you. And this really is what happens when people get together. So there's a local shift. There's a local shift in paradigm. People started reclaiming the streets. For the first time in their lives, Egyptians felt truly Egyptian and truly able to take care of their country. You had spontaneous cleanups. You had civilian roadblocks. You had people taking care of their country. And I tell you what, guys, in the 18 days before Mubarak stepped down, Egypt was never cleaner. It was never more organized, and it was never safer. And this freaked the hell out of the authorities because they thought they were the ones in charge. And what they found out was that when the people find their strength, they're much stronger than the regime. So it's, it's really interesting because, you know, we, 
We talk about this, but people don't really understand what self-organization is like until they've experienced it. It's freaky. It's really crazy. You know, you have so many things that happen on their own spontaneously. And it's amazing to have been somewhere where there's this shift, this paradigm shift. There's, you feel the social subconscious. You feel the people feeling each other and really starting to behave in a way that's mind-blowing. You know, it's something that you really have to experience. And that's, this is what happens. This is what happens when a people unite. This is what happens when a people organize. The regime steps down. I mean, you can't, there's no way that the regime can handle that much uh, energy. And it wasn't just felt locally. You know, the ripples of the revolution filtered out into the world. And you had movements like Occupy totally inspired by young Egyptians. And there's some irony here because, you know, Egyptians spent most of their lives being inspired by the West and trying to be like the West. And this is the first time that the West was being inspired by Egypt. And, you know, Egyptians were really the talk of the town. And I tell you what, you know, this really, really made Egyptians even prouder to be Egyptians. And it started this really positive cycle of people loving where they are and being even stronger. So, basically, you've toppled the regime, you're young, you've discovered your strength, you're Egyptian, you're proud. What do you do next? You know? This is the t-shirt that I wore when Mubarak stepped down. And I remember thinking, what are we going to do next? I mean, you know, the bad guy's gone. You know, revolution's not finished, of course, but you know, what next? What's next? Well, the revolution then moved from Facebook, from Twitter, from the ether into the, the square, and from the square into the cleanups and into the civilian patrols, and from there into the lives of normal Egyptians. You know, we started to have this wave of organizations, you know, farming initiatives, robotics, tech, education. Suddenly, everything was possible, and everyone felt that they owned their country again and that they should be part of that change. So, you know, this is really, this, this really created like this, this vacuum, you know, all of these initiatives springing up, all of these young Egyptians who never stood a chance of being able to do something, they needed to be incubated. And this is where the incubators came in. So we had things like Startup Weekend, we had co-working spaces, Startup Cups, competition left, right and center. I mean, this is what Wetler was just talking about, you know. Ibdat with Google was one of the things that really uh, created that. And this is something, this is a, a rare instance where people from the ground state a need and people from the top have to address that. And this is really how Ice Cairo was born. You know, Ice Cairo, um, innovation, collaboration, entrepreneurship was really born from these conditions, was born from a need. Um, Ice Cairo is the third ice hub. So the first one was in Addis Ababa uh, called Ice Addis. The second one was in Weimar in uh, Bauhaus University, Ice Bauhaus. And now we have ICE, uh, ICE Cairo. And what ICE Cairo is, is a green tech innovation hub. So basically, we focus on real world solutions on the ground. And what we're trying to do is create jobs for young Egyptians in areas that are sustainable. So we want something that's really going to keep going. We want something, and we, we don't want to put them in a job in fossil fuels or, you know, it really is about something that is ongoing, that is sustainable. So if we talk about innovation, collaboration, and entrepreneurship, and we talk about the Egyptian revolution, well, Egyptians have demonstrated that they can be innovative. Here are some of the helmets of the revolution. We have uh, recycling, a bit of upcycling, and we have Mr. Baguette. Uh, I don't know if you can see him. He uses bread for a helmet. Um, and uh, Heba Amin was showing these slides yesterday. This actually became a meme of the revolution, one of the memes. But this, if this doesn't demonstrate innovation, I really don't know what does. And, uh, Aha, it's done the same thing to me now. There we go. Collaboration. Um, this is crazy, guys. This is an image of a field hospital that was spontaneously erected during the revolution on its own. It treated thousands of people. They had ad hoc ambulance services, which were basically motorbikes, where you'd put the wounded on the back, drive them to one of these places, and they'd get treated. This was organized by the people, for the people. It had nothing to do with the authorities. And the authorities were trying to stop these guys from working, and they couldn't. People really took care of each other. Entrepreneurship. So you're in a revolution. The world is watching. You're throwing over the regime. And you know you need to look good. You need to really look good for, the, for this to happen, really. So you're in the tent all day. You've done your demonstration. You need to go have your little haircut and your shave feel all clean again, get back to your revolution. So actually, in Tahrir Square, I mean, I'm sure some of you have been, I know some of you have been, um, there's hundreds of businesses that arise during the revolution. I mean, if you were hungry, there'd be someone serving food. 
uh, if your favorite opposition leader was having a, a speech, then you'd want to sit down in your little cafe, have your little uh, Turkish coffee, listen to the speech. And it really became this ecosystem where you'd go in, and it was people policing the entrance of the square. It was people selling you things in the square. And the police weren't allowed in. They had to stay out because that was the new rule, and that's just the way it is. So, this is what we've done at Ice Cairo. We've created a space, it's a co-working space. Um, these are some of the members of our community. Um, we have high-speed internet, we've got uh, printers, photocopiers, all the things that you would need to have your startup functioning. And we run a ton of events at this space. We do things like graphic facilitation, business skills, we do workshops, trainings, and Really, we even have a fab lab, uh, a fabrication laboratory. So we have very cool machines like 3D printers that print in three dimensions, laser cutters that can cut almost anything. We have uh, CNC machines. We actually had a CNC machine so big that if we had switched it on, it would have knocked the floor down. Um, so we had to get out of there quickly. But with these machines, with the power tools, with the hand tools, you can make almost anything. And this is really what we do. We prototype. We make things with our hand that can then be used on the ground. This is an example of that. Um, this is the solar water heater that we developed. It's totally open source. It costs about $200. It can be made by anyone. It's made from off-the-shelf parts. Uh, this is us in the far south of Egypt, just above the, the, the border with Sudan. And uh, this community has, is off-grid. Most of Egypt is off-grid. Um, they have diesel generators which power themselves. But you can't get hold of diesel because the government is in turmoil and their subsidies are too much. So these guys needed a solution. Um, and this is one of the solutions. This is in Arabic and in English, the manual. And it will be eventually a video. We're working on that now to transcend literacy. But this is one of the products that communities can build to create businesses for themselves and also solve a challenge. We also do entrepreneurship. Um, we do, we're basically creating an ecosystem with people. And this is an example of the business canvas model roadshow that we did with VC for Africa and InnoVentures. I think there's Bill and Ben here from uh, VC for Africa. And this is one of the examples of prototyping businesses, like, OK, I've got this product. I've got a solar water heater. Who am I selling it to? How am I going to sell it? You know? And it really is this, this process that we're working on. And you can't really talk about entrepreneurship without, without talking about responsible and inclusive business practices. So we're working with another GIZ department to try and get existing organizations to behave responsibly to be inclusive in their business use, and to encourage startups to really kind of absorb the principles of responsible and inclusive business. So a lot of people ask us, how do you do what you do? Well, it's pretty simple. There's a challenge. The challenge could be access to water, access to energy, you know, anything that people are experiencing on the ground. So the first thing you do is inform the community. Guys, I've got a challenge. What do you guys think we should do? You collaborate. You do these workshops. You co-create. You find solutions together. And then when you found a couple of solutions you think are really going to work, you adapt them to the local context. That's very important. Once you've adapted them, you choose one thing that you're going to stick with. That's your product. And then from that stage, you have two things that you need to do. One is work on the business model, and the second is to finish the physical prototype. So in terms of the prototype, you build it in the Fab Lab or wherever. You refine it, you test it, you refine it, you test it until it's something that's actually working. And then you're ready to incubate that product. But at the same time, you've got to work out who your market is, what your sales plan is, who your team are. So this is really the entrepreneurship ecosystem that we use with partners to try and literally take this physical product that is the result of a challenge in the community and turn that into a green business. This is our community. This is one of the events we had at the EcoCities camp. Uh, our community is awesome, guys. I mean, if you follow the principles of uh, biodiversity and if you follow biomimicry and permaculture, you know that like diversity is resilience. The more diverse a set is, the more resilient it is. And here we have people from entirely different backgrounds, entirely different ages, from all over Egypt. And really, this event saw civil society, it saw government, it saw academia, it saw private sector coming together to solve challenges as a unit and then turn these challenges into initiatives. And from this, we did have a lot of initiatives formed. Um, more importantly, our overall community, like the online community, is several thousand people. Considering that ICE Cairo has been around for about six months, Having 3,000 people in your community is ridiculous. And this is really the, the wave of energy that we're arriving that's post-revolution. I mean, everyone wants to do something, and they want to do it with their hands, and they want to solve the, the challenges that their communities have. 
And it really is this wave that's really powering the movement forwards. Um, the fact that our hub, we got, we got our hub in, in October as a physical space, it's not decorated yet at all. And that no one cares about that. Civil society are doing events there all the time. There's workshops there all the time. And literally, we don't know how we're going to stop everyone so that we can decorate the hub so that we can then have a nice hub. <laughs> it's a bit of a challenge already. So. so what have we found? Well, we found that, yes, we've created green jobs, which is awesome. We found that people are loving the events, that the trainers are there, that all the expertise is there. We found that because of this, more hubs in Egypt are trying to emerge. So we have Ice Alex. Uh, that's just emerged. We have Ice Aswan, that's in the deep south, beautiful place, that's emerging. And on the international level, we have a whole bunch of hubs that want to come out. We have Palestine, um, we have South Sudan. I mean, there's just, there's, there we have Jordan. I mean, people everywhere are saying, wow, this is working, so we want to do the same thing. And what we've also found is that there are challenges to what we're doing, real challenges. And I'm sure that, you know, some of you guys from Afri Labs will be aware of this, but a lot of the time, someone comes to one of our events and we say, what do you need? And they say, I need money. And uh, you ask them why, and they don't know. And you ask them how much, and they don't know. And you ask them about their production costs, they don't know who you're selling to, well, I don't know. And eventually you realize that that guy doesn't need money, that girl doesn't need money, they need everything before the money. They need all of the skills that will allow them to understand who they're selling to, why they're selling it, and how much it costs. And this is something that maybe you guys can help us with. We need to inspire the community with expertise. And really, like the other hubs are the best places to look. You know, if a hub in Nairobi or a hub in Kenya can teach us something that we can teach our community, then again, that's the resilience and the diversity we're talking about. And we really need to multiply this effect because the combination, I don't know if you guys have seen the Global Innovation Lounge out there, but that's really where the Afri Hubs thing is happening. And this is a whole bunch of different people with different experiences. And, you know, if you bring them all together, you've got something really magical that's happening. So if we talk about the future, well, this is a future for us. Um, this is our... Uptown hub. It's being built right now next to the airport. It's uh, six shipping containers. Very sexy. You know, you walk into this and the year is 2080. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, this is really where we're hoping to create a space for our community that inspires them to do crazy cool things, that solve things, that solve challenges on the ground, that can become businesses. And we're really excited about this, you know. But we're also really excited about, you know, all the friends that we've made at the Global Innovation Lounge, all the people that we're going to be working with. We really feel that. You know, being here at Republica, meeting each other and doing all of this stuff is really going to add just so much more to what we're already doing. So, uh, I'd like to thank uh, GIZ for bringing us here. Um, I'd really like to thank Republica for having us. And, you know, in the words of Vanilla Ice, if there was a problem, you are solve it. <laughs> so, uh, please grab one of the team afterwards. Um, Hamad Radwan's over there. Salma's over here. Um, please speak to Ice Addis, Ice Bauhaus. Please speak to the other hubs. Everyone has got some really cool things that they can offer. And um, yeah, thanks a lot. So I'm afraid you're just going to have to watch me rather than any slides for two reasons. Uh, one, I had some computer problems. Two, I'm talking about stuff in the real world, so I feel it's more important. And three, Adam's already covered quite a lot of the things that I wanted to say, so, <laughs> so I'm going to be making it up as I go along. Um, what really fascinates me about all of this um, transferal and these new behaviors and things that are kind of emerging is how much passion and energy and drive there is and how much desire there is really to form communities and build spaces and create spaces that people can actually address their own problems locally, that they can empower themselves economically, that they can learn from one another, they can generate their own income streams, they can generate their own businesses. And there's, there's a lot of passion coming out of this, not just in the, in, in the African region, or in the Middle Eastern region, but also across the whole world. So we're also seeing these kind of behaviors emerge from a very different, maybe economic and sociological context. But co-working space movement, the Fab Labs movement, the hacker spaces movement, all of these spaces are to a degree sharing um, part of the same 
makeup. They might have a very different process and a very different approach. Some of them are coming at it from a perspective of um, creating entrepreneurship and creating new business models and using that as an opportunity for social enablement. Whilst if you look at the more Western models, a lot of them are actually looking more at collaborative consumption and alternative models of existence in response to our economic climate. But ultimately, they're coming at the same core. Stuff is messed up, how do we come together and fix it? How do we actually address these problems ourselves as communities? How do we come together and together actually build something that helps us get to where we want to be? And that's what I find really interesting about these spaces. And that's, for me, the kernel. And I'm aware that I'm talking about a lot of different diverse spaces here. So if I misrepresent anybody, please call out bullshit at some point or feel free to challenge me, because these are really thoughts in process, and I'm just making this up as I go. So please bear with me. But this ecosystem has these shared attributes that I've been talking about, but also the, this aspect of diversity that you picked up on. Um, the ecosystem itself is diverse. They are all prototyping new ways of working, new ways of collaborating, new ways and means of social empowerment. And we have a lot that we can actually learn between these spaces, both from the individuals that are coming into them, but also from the hub managers and the hub leaders when we bring this knowledge together and explore what we do. These are bridging spaces that bring together different cultures, different religions, different minorities, people from businesses, NGOs, local grassroots organizations, people that are impoverished with people that are well off. They really create an opportunity for shared learning and shared peer environments. And I think this is the, one of the most important things that these spaces offer, is this opportunity for peer learning and learning together. Because ultimately, this is one of the biggest challenges that we have right now, is education, mindset, thoughts. As you alluded to, people are coming in without a general awareness even of what they don't know. They, they, they don't know what they don't know. How do they get to the point where they're entrepreneurial if they have to actually unpick and analyze and assess and try and prototype and learn together? So, we have a fundamental problem with the education system, both within the West and also within, within the African continent and the, the whole world, actually. I don't think there's a working educational model right now for the world that we live in. It's so disruptive and changing so swiftly and so quickly that the, the, the old paradigm just does not work anymore. This was designed to create very modular structures that fitted into a system which was based on uh, an industrialized society where we were cogs in the machine. This has changed massively now. We need to adapt and we need to change how we actually engage in the act of learning. And I think this is one of the opportunities that's created from these spaces. We also need to change what we're actually exploring in terms of literacy. Uh, because, I mean, one of the things I've observed um, both in Egypt and also some of the feedback I've had um, from the other spaces I've talked to is these key aspects, actually, that, that are required for collaboration, for example, and openness, and, and how we actually open people up. And these things are only experiential. They're not something I can tell you. I mean, I can tell you, but you'll go, yeah, that sounds great, hippie, goodbye. You, you have to actually experience what it means. Uh, you have to actually experience what it is to work in those environments in order to actually change your mind and change your behavior. And this is also what interests me, and I'm learning from one of the other spaces we're working with, uh, so Ice Alex and, uh, and Roy Atti, is they're not just working with entrepreneurs and postgraduates, they're also working backwards. So they're actually going into schools and they're working with schools and actually developing their own entrepreneurial pipeline. And this is one of the things that we really have to address as spaces, I think, and it's very important to consider, is where we're actually at and the infrastructures that we need in order to maximize benefit. And part of these infrastructures, as well as being able to move around, so for in Cairo, getting stuff from A to B, being able to access materials and parts, uh, being able to evaluate your local ecosystem and see what you have, 
developing forms of material and physical literacy so you can actually engage with the world around you rather than engaging it only through a verbal means of communication. We have to also develop the means of being able to pick up the material again and play with it and understand how to make it. We need to know how to interact with one another as individuals. We need to develop emotional literacy. And these, these are things that can really only be practiced and acquired in the, in the real world. The internet helped us prototype some behaviors of sharing. It helped us prototype some behaviors of working and collaboration. But ultimately, a lot of these things are physical, human, intuitive things that we've forgotten, having focused on a more uh, conventional form of literacy, of reading, writing, and arithmetic. So skills are an issue, and OTAN is an issue, and education is an issue. And we need to really focus, I think, on these attributes and explore where we go. I've no idea of how long I'm going to take, so can somebody keep the time as well? And I think as hubs, we have to look at this from a perspective of how we actually focus on diseducation and unlearning. How do we inoculate people against... <laughs> Thank you. Um, how, how do we inoculate the, the youth against bad ideas? Um, how do we inoculate them against being closed-minded and accepting the culture that is around them, accepting the norms of society? We, we, we need to really address this, because if we're going to address our problems, these are the fundamental underlying issues. The spaces can provide infrastructures. They can provide tools. You can bring CNC machines. You can bring fab labs. Um, you can provide access to entrepreneurial global networks. But unless we have the mental and emotional skills, and unless the, the, the people that are working in these countries, developing the hubs, the communities around these hubs, have these mental, emotional, physical skills to actually engage with these opportunities, to take these opportunities, then these opportunities aren't going to go in the direction that we would like. So I think this is really a fundamental thing that we have to explore. And I think Adam already highlighted there is a massive opportunity here and now with these hubs coming together. And it's been a real learning experience um, for me. And I think there's actually a couple of other people who should be up here um, talking about these issues, such as uh, JP and Stefania, and various of you guys that I've spoken to over the course of the weekend. Uh, because also, I'm only representing my own culture and, uh, and where I'm coming from but we have this opportunity to learn from one another and migrate knowledge. So where do we take this? I think one of the opportunities we have is actually to look at how we can package uh, content, but also package experiences and opportunities to create experiences. Because if we're really to learn, we need to create those provocations and these opportunities for one another. And this is what excites me about the shameless plug. Um, work that we're doing with uh, Hackademia. Um, because the way that Stefania works is she gives people the opportunity and the tools and resources to learn for themselves. And I think this is also what spaces and enabling spaces do very well and very effectively. It's where you create the opportunity for people to explore to themselves and you give them a provocation. But also providing certain kits and tools and resources so that you can begin with the point of inspiration. So, in this instance, we're developing a kit that will allow people, um, allow children to learn about air quality by building their own air quality sensor. And from that, they can engage not only in the topics and learning the skills of soldering themselves, engaging with data, engaging with the web, but also engaging with their environment and starting to ask questions around their environment. Where does this lead and what opportunities does this create? So this is one way we can look at it. We can also look at how we migrate the other knowledge, the business in a box, the learning content, so that we can take what works in one space and look at how we can adapt it locally. But we have to recognize as we do this that we have to adapt it locally. We have to understand first. We have to listen. We have to work with the people that are building the communities that are starting in the grassroots. We can't just start and go, OK, CNC machine here, Fab Lab here. Um, drop, in a, uh, drop in a computer into the middle of nowhere and hope that somebody knows how to use it. You really need to understand what resources and tools are on the ground. So I think JP said it best when he said 15% of um, the country in Tanzania has electricity. So like when, when you're addressing these issues of the internet and the web and machine tools and everything else, 
you need to really look and understand like what's there, what's working, how are people working. And this is also where I think the hubs provide a valuable interface, is their, their listening points, their points of interaction, their points where we can learn from and we can understand what we can do together. And if we're to do anything, we have to do it together. How much time do I have? Any idea? No? OK. Somebody just stop me if I need, and I'll also turn over to questions shortly. The other thing, I think, is we have to look at how we move this further, how we move beyond spaces. If we're looking at spaces as enabling learning environments, how do we actually take it beyond the space themselves? I, I heard one great quote over the course of the, uh, the, the warm-up meeting, which was, if you're focusing on the space, you're in danger of becoming a glorified landlord. Another great statement was, how do we build neighborhoods? So how do we look at the infrastructures that already exist? How do we look at the schools, the universities, the libraries? These beha it's behaviors that we're migrating, it's content that we're migrating, it's opportunities that we're creating. So how do we hack existing spaces? How do we change a shisha bar into an entrepreneurial cafe or a learning environment? How do we actually engage with the larger public framework to really shape reality? Because when we build spaces, we, we also we create a safety net for ourselves and we create a very safe bubble into which we can engage. And this, to begin with, is a very powerful thing. But at the same time, if we're really to have a larger impact, we need to start pushing outwards and looking at how we can build neighborhoods. And for the guys that are staying on for the tour of Berlin, you'll get the opportunity to actually experience this directly with the Makerplatz. So if you look at Berlin, actually, this is really a thriving ecosystem now. It's not one space, it's multiple spaces. And we don't see content as independent. We don't see learning as independent. We just see spaces as opportunities to access one another. And this, I think, is also working very well in Cairo, Revised Cairo that the content is being applied in the different spaces. So Hani Kodari, for example, he's taking workshops on composting, on biogas, and he's running these in all of the different hubs within Cairo so that everybody has the opportunity to access the content because you can't always travel downtown unless you want to spend two hours uh, stuck in traffic, if you're lucky. Um, so. This content migration is a real opportunity for sharing and learning and moving forward together. And I think these are the things that we also need to look at how we can explore and how we can move forward. But I think primarily there is a, a tremendous opportunity now emerging and arising as we start to address our own problems by hacking our own spaces, building our own spaces and creating our own spaces together. And we're seeing the corporate world get involved in this. We're seeing them get involved like projects like uh, Zappos in, on, in Las Vegas, where they're actually regenerating an entire area. And community spaces are an aspect of this. The social value is becoming recognized. But we also have to take care as we bring such people in and large organizations jump on this bandwagon quoting somebody else, I think it was you again, JP, wasn't it? I don't know. When you jump on the bandwagon, if you're a large organization, you're in danger of breaking the axle. And I think this is a really good uh, analogy. You have to look at how people are moving, the direction that they're going in, and then look at how you can empower them and move them forward. But you have to also be aware as an organization of your own faults and your own flaws and your own problems and your own infrastructures and ensure that in interfacing with these spaces, you don't end up holding them back from where they're going. Look at how you can clear the road. Look at how you can build the road ahead of them. But don't jump on the wagon. You need to really take care of that. So I think there's tremendous opportunities here for building neighborhoods and hacking the culture as a whole. I think there's a massive amount of opportunity for change. And I really look forward to continuing the discussions with everybody from the AfriLabs and the Global Innovation Networks that's come here and looking at what we can take forward. I'll shut up now and take any questions because I've probably rambled a bit and been a bit vague. We got time for questions or are we in the break?
Any questions, provocations, disagreements, shouts of bullshit? <laughs> Have I represented fairly? Okay, Stefania, you had a question? If you had all the resources in the world tomorrow, mm -hmm. and you could go and kickstart maker hubs, or you call it fab labs, whatever you want to call them um, in Africa, what would you do? Uh, I think if I had all of the resources in the world tomorrow, it would actually be a very dangerous thing. And, and I think this is really the, 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 the key thing that I'm trying to focus on, is that when you have too much, you have no creative constraint. You, you, you have abundance. We have more operating capacity on our computer now than we ever did. What do we do? We fill it with operating system so that the computer is no faster or more adaptive than it was before. I, I fundamentally believe that what we have to look at is how we see, how we learn, how we engage with our environment and our ecosystem. And uh, as, a, as, a, as a case in point, um, there are large amounts of e-waste all over, all over Africa, yet we're looking at shipping in electronics uh, that are inaccessible and we don't have the logistical infrastructure. So people are going, we want Arduinos. And this is just creating the same problem. We're creating a dependency. We, ne we need to look, or, well, I say we, I mean, I'm happy to help, but this is merely a provocation. I say we from a global perspective, but we, we, we need to look at using what we have within our environment to build the things that we need and to build the things that we want, not build the things that are shiny or buy the things that are shiny. And if we're really to adapt our problems, it's a, it's a way of seeing, like, it's how we read our environment. Uh, is adapting the principles of permaculture and applying it to the to the urban landscape, applying it to the to the waste and the the education and the human capacity. Um, these are all of the things that we need, and we need to clearly apply what we have to what we need, and and use these behaviours effectively. And and I think all of the capacity or resource in the world won't help us unless we know and learn how to think critically and how to actually engage with the world critically. And that's what I really like about your project, is it gives people the opportunity to get that. Um, and all of these projects, you know, you create a provocation, you give people the opportunity to learn for themselves. You don't, you, you can't necessarily teach these things. You can only experience them, practice them, and I think, as you said yesterday, Adam, stretch the muscles. And we have to start stretching and exercising our mental muscles and our physical muscles rather than running towards technology and running away from ourselves as humans because this is, I think, a, a, a dangerous paradigm and it's not going to lead us where we need to get to. Stephen. Thanks. I'm wondering if you've had... Um problems with political acceptance, especially in Egypt where there's so much stuff in flux, if there's been maybe some backlash or opposition or uh, mistrust perhaps at what you guys are doing? I think there's, there, there is, um, certainly when I started talking to people in Alexandria or engaging with a hackerspace for a com community, for example, there's a mistrust of large outside organizations and NGOs. And, and this is something that we also have to be aware of, is that cultural baggage that we carry with us representing certain organizations. Um, in terms of the, the political system, it's more disruptive, I think, in terms of not being able to work in the space because the revolution is taking place. And, and this is the, the main thing. I, I think also whilst what I'm saying is um, <laughs> it is political and what spaces do are political, we're, we're focused on actions rather than on conversations and dialogues. We're not out in the street shouting about we need this. Instead, it's more giving people the opportunity to acquire it for themselves. So to a degree, there's a degree of stealth there. Um, but I can't say personally that I've experienced any, any problems with it, but I'm a disconnected white guy uh, from this perspective. Um, so it might be better to ask Adam or, or Mo about those experiences or the guys in, um, in, in Addis, but personally it's more the inconvenience of not being able to go into this space. Do you have anything to add on that, Adam? Or? 
Okay. Any other questions? I think we're done anyway. Thank you very much for your time. So, Jay, guys, thanks a lot for these perspectives on how to make a difference in the real world. I think maybe you can meet, if you have more questions, you can meet outside for a minute. Uh, we're going to have a short break, just seven minutes. Wir machen kurz sieben Minuten Pause, glaube ich. Und um drei geht's weiter mit Daniel Bröckerhoff, der offene Journalist. Bis gleich.